Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. I would like to take this moment to tell you folks thank you for joining me on Ralph Reads and to please tell a friend to tell a friend to like, share, comment, and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Today on Ralph Reads, I bring you the fourth volume to the Chronicles of Robert Beck better known to all as Iceberg Slim, who writes, Pimp, the story of my life. Let the reading commence. Chapter 7, Melody Off Key The blast of the phone woke me. The pad was dark as hell. I flung my left hand out for the runt. She wasn't there. I fumbled the receiver to my ear. I said, Hello, this is Mary's brother. He said, I want to speak to Mary. Put her on, yeah? I said, She just went out. She's taking a walk. He hung up. I cradled the phone on the bedside table. I switched the table lamp on. I checked Mickey. It was 7.30 p.m. I wondered if I had blown the runt. I got up and checked the closet. Her clothes were still there. I went to the dresser. I checked the 40 slats. Two were missing. There was a note beside the scratch. It read, Daddy, I took a deuce for the street. I'm gonna hunt my ass off. Please try to be a little sweet to your little bitch dog, huh? I thought, I'm stumbling upon some pimp answers. It looks like the tougher a stud is, the more of a whore goes for him. I'll be glad when those four days pass and I go with top to the sweet cut-in. I gotta watch that the runt don't get hip. I'm banging stuff. Gee, I'm starved. I gotta eat before I bang some girl. I went to the phone. The broad who should have been a wrestler picked up. I said, anybody down there to get me bacon and eggs? She said, Wait a minute, I'll let you talk to Silas, the elevator man. The old Maggie and Jigs fan said, Yeah, big timer, what is it? I said, Silas, can I get a bacon with eggs over light and toast? He said, Yeah, there's a greasy spoon right across the street I'm going now. I hung up and went to the closet. I got the spy piece. I went to the window. I saw the old jink hobble across the street toward the Busy Bee Cafe. I made a sweep up and down the street to spot the runt. I didn't see her. I zeroed the spy into the greasy joint. The runt was draining a cup of coffee at the counter. She came out. Her eyes flashed whitely up at our window. She walked down the street, twisting her rear end at the passing cars. I saw the round black ass hook a white trick in the black hog. He skittled to the curb. She got in. I wondered if it was the same joker that called. I ducked into the shower. I was toweling off when I heard a rap on the door. I sarong the towel. On the way to the door, I scooped the can of gangster off the dresser and stuck it behind the mirror. I heard Silas outside the door whistling when the saints go marching in. I opened the door. He had a tray in his hands. I took it. A paper napkin fluttered to the floor. He stooped for it. I looked into the big brown eyes of a pretty yellow broad coming out of the door across the hall. The scar-faced stud who tooted at the roost had walked out in front of her. He had a saxophone case under his arm. She rolled her lustrous eyes at me. They rocketed it to that lump on the sarong. Her sly, hot smile made a flat statement. Please try it for size. I skull-noted her. 
Silas finally tore his eyes from her rear end, floating down the hall. He had squeezed the paper napkin into a damp ball. He said, That's a buck. I put the tray on the dresser. I took three slats to the door and gave them to him. I said, Silas, that's quite a package with Mr. Hyde. Give me a rundown, huh? He said, yeah. She stacked tough enough to make a preacher lay his Bible down. The hornblower ain't had her but a couple of years. She's done rammed her cat scent up his nose and got him hooked. She was a whore until he squared her up. He got it bad. He don't allow her out of his sight. Any club he plays, she has to be right there stuck in his ass. If I was 30 years younger, I'd steal her. Thanks, Big Tama, for the deuce. Anytime you want something, call old Silas. Sit the tray outside your door when you finish. I sat on the side of the bed and wolfed down the bacon and eggs. I felt better. I wanted to feel wonderful. I put together everything for bang time. I held the end of a necktie in my teeth. I coiled it and tightened it around my arm. On first stab, I hit a perfect bullseye. I did Top's jack-off bit. I threw up. I just made it to the john. The kick was greater than the one at Top's. I thought, what if my black face like magic turned white? Shit, I could go out that hotel front door and sneak through the barbed wire stockade. I'd be like a wolf turned loose on a flock of sheep. That white world wouldn't tumble that I'm a nigger. I could pay him all back in spades. The dummy, the white bull, the bastard judge that crucified me on my first rap. Once I escape this black hell, I'll find a way, all right. Well, nigga, you're pretty, but a bleach cream will never be invented that will make you white. So, pimp your ass off and be somebody with what you got. It could be worse. You could be an ugly nigga. I dressed and powdered my face. That sure was one pretty son of a bitch in that mirror. I saw a roach scouting the tray's rim. I shoved the tray out into the hall. I thought, I gotta start stalking that fine bitch across the hall. Maybe I'll decoy the runt to get past that scar-faced watchdog. I guess I'll take a walk. Maybe I could cop my second whore. I feel hard and lucky as a horseshoe. I put the can of reefer and the other sizzle into a paper bag. I locked the door and went down the hall toward the elevator. On the way, I stopped at the porter's broom closet. It was unlocked. I tiptoed and shoved a bag of sizzle behind some junk on a shelf. The cocaine had me froggy. I saw the floor indicator stop at floor number two. I took the stairway to the lobby. I dropped the key on the desk and glided to the street. The cocaine had fitted wings on my feet. I felt cool breathless, and magnificent. It was a balmy 80 degrees. I was glad I'd left the Benny. I walked toward a rainbow bouquet of neon maybe 10 blocks away. My senses screamed on the razor edge of cocaine. It was like walking through a battlefield. The streaking headlights of the car arcing the night were giant tracer bullets. The rattling, crashing streetcars were army tanks. The frightened, hopeless black faces of the passengers peered through the grimy windows. They were battle-shocked soldiers doomed forever to the front trenches. I passed beneath an L-train bridge. A terrified, glowing face loomed toward me in the tunnel's gloom. It was an elderly white man Trapped behind enemy lines, a train furled by overhead. It bombed and strafed the street. The shrapnel fell in gritty clouds. I was too nervous for the combat zone. I whistled at a general in a yellow staff car to halt. 
He whisked me to that oasis of neon. It turned out he was a mercenary. He shafted me a slat and a quarter for the evacuation. I got out and morphed toward a haggling flash, the fun house. It was a bar. I opened the door and stepped inside. It almost busted the gaskets in my bowels. A phosphorescent green skeleton popped up out of the floor in front of me. It screeched a hollow howl and then dived back into the floor through a trap door. I just stood there shaking. I couldn't figure why those crazy jokers at the bar were yucking like pickaninnies. To stay with the program, I mastered a kingfish grin. I went to the bar and sat between Amos and Andy. I saw a tall stud with a Frankenstein mask on behind the log. He darted his hand in a sneaky way under the log. There was a whooshing noise like a tire going flat. My stool descended beneath me. I looked up at Amos. My nose was an inch from the log. Amos was grinning down at me. Amos said, You sure enough ain't been here before? You from the Bigfoot country? Andy said, Wait till he catches wind. He gonna buy us a pitcher of suds. We gonna learn, old homeboy, about this big city rigmarole. Everybody at the crowded log yucked in a deep south accent. Frankenstein pushed his mercy button. I felt the stool stretching up. With the cocaine kangarooing me and this booby trap nest of low-life suckers I stumbled into, I had more than a frantic yearning for maybe 420 at the Haven. He walked down the log to me. He said, It's all in fun. Welcome to the fun house. What'll it be? I ignored him. I got off the stool. I looked down at it. Its metal legs were tubular and anchored to the floor. It had to be a compressed air gizmo. I stepped back and looked at the two ex-cotton pickers. I twitched my nose. I looked down and around them, then the length of the log. I fingered the button on that slingshot in my rays. I said, King Fished. Holy mackerel, boys. You smell that? I always wonder if in some post stupid niggas funky ass nappy head southern mammy ain't done shit out another square ass ugly bastard turd. Amos and Andy dropped their jibs like plantation idiots. They shot an anguished look at the white joker behind the log. I walked out the door. They didn't dig my humor. Maybe it was too in. I slammed into a perfumed linebacker. In reflex, I threw my arms around her soft shoulders. She had the flawless face of Olivia de Havilland. She was bigger and prettier. I felt the fabric of her tailored black suit petal stroke across my fingertips. She was the finest broad I'd seen since my last movie. I wondered if she was a whore. I decided to hit on her. I said, I'm sorry. Ain't it a bitch? Baby, the first time we meet, it had to be in a collision like two square. Sugar, were you going into this tramp joint? Believe me, there's no action inside for a package like you. I just stopped in to make a call. My name is Blood. Her big curvy legs were wide tracked. I saw the fabulous shadow of her rear end on the sidewalk. Through the filmy orange blouse, I saw a pink mole on her milk-white midriff. She brushed back a wayward lock of silky black hair from one of the big electric blue eyes. Her even choppers gleamed like rare china. Her crimson tongue doodled across the cupid bow lips. She was doing a bit that would have shook up a eunuch. She said, Blood, how quaint. Your idiom is fascinating. My name is Melody. I don't drink in bars. Occasionally, I go to a supper club. I am not looking for action. As a matter of fact, my car is disabled. I was going inside to call for help when our heavenly bodies collided. 
Is it possible that you're not oblivious to the esoteric aspects of car repair? Mine is there. At the curb. My eyes followed her manicured finger to the sparkling new Lincoln sedan. Everything about her hollered class and affluence. I thought, this beautiful white bitch has class. She sounds like an egghead. With wheels like that, she's probably got a bundle in the damper. Maybe she's got some rich sucker in her web. I'll nut roll on her. I'll stay out of the pimp roll until I case her. I'll go sweet William on her. Maybe I can string her out and get all that scratch she's got. Then make a whore out of her. With her rear end, this bitch is sitting on a mint. I said, darling, I am not a mechanic. I did learn a little about cars from a buddy in the prep school I just finished. You get in, I'll raise the hood and have a look. She got in, I raised the hood. I spotted the trouble right away. A battery cable had jarred loose. I put it back on. I looked around the hood and signaled for the starter try. She did, and smiled happily when the engine throbbed to life. She waved me to her. I stuck my head through the open window. She said, Are you driving? If not, I should love to take you wherever you want to go. I said, Honey, I'm not driving, and it's a long, sad story. You don't want to hear my troubles. If you drop me off at some nice bar, I promise not to bore you with it. I got in. She pulled out into traffic. We cruised along. For two minutes, we were silent. I was busy trying to think of the opener for that long, sad story. I had read a cell house full of books. I knew I could rise to a smooth pitch. That old philosopher convict had told me I should forget the pimp game and be a con man. I said, Melody, doesn't fate puppeteer humans in the weird way? There I was coming out of that joint. I had just called a garage a hundred miles away. The engine of my car burnt up on my way here from St. Louis a week ago. I was depressed, lonely, and hopeless in a big friendless city. The mechanic had just dropped the bad news. The charge to get the car is a hundred and fifty dollars. I have fifty. I was blind with worry when I came out that door. My elderly mother has to have a pancreas operation. I came here to work for a contractor in the suburbs. I'm a talented carpenter. I need my car to get to work. I'm committed to start work the first of next week. Mama's going to die sure as the sun rises in the east unless I get that money for her operation. The strange, wonderful thing is, darling, with all these problems, I feel so good. See those garbage cans glittering between the tenements? To me, they are giant jewels. I want to climb up on those rooftops and cry out to the stars, I have found the beautiful melody. Surely, I'm the luckiest black man alive. Convince me you're real. Don't evaporate like a beautiful mirage. I'd die if you did. Out of the side scope in my eye, I saw those awesome thighs quivering. She almost crashed a Lincoln into the rear end of the gray Studebaker ahead of us. She cut in sharply and grated the Lincoln's wheels against the curb. She shut the motor off and turned toward me. Her eyes were blue bonfires of passion. The pulse of the satin throat was mania -sing. She slid close to me. She zippered her scarlet mouth to mine. That confection tongue flooded my mouth with sugar. Her nails dug into my thighs. She gazed at me. She said, Blood, you sweet black poetic panther. Does that prove I'm real? No, I know I don't want to evaporate ever. Please, let's don't go to a bar. You can't solve your problems with alcohol. My parents are out of the city until tomorrow noon. Settle for coffee and conversation at my place.
Will you, Blood? Perhaps we can find solutions to your problems there. Besides, I'm expecting Mother to call me at home later this evening. I said, Angel of Mercy, I'm putting myself in your tender hands. She lived a long way from the black concentration camp. She drove for almost an hour. I could smell the pungent odors of early April plant life. This white world was like leaving hell and riding through heaven. The neat rows of plush houses shone in the moonlight. The streets were quiet as maybe the cathedral in Reims. I thought, ain't it a bitch? 98% of the black people back there in hell will be born and die and never know the joys of this earthly heaven. There ain't but two passports the white folks honor. A white skin or a bale of scratch. I sure got to pimp good and cop my scratch passport. Well, at least I get a Cinderella crack at heaven. This is good. It's hipping me to what I'm missing. We turned into her driveway. I saw the soft glow of a table lamp behind blue drapes in the front room. She parked the Lincoln in a pink stucco garage that matched the house. The garage was connected to the house. We went through the back door. We passed through the kitchen. Even in the dimness, it sparkled. We moved like burglars through the half-darkened house. We walked on deep pile carpet up a stairway. We got to the top. She stopped. She whispered, Blood, I was born in this house. Everybody in the block knows me. If some friend passed and knew someone was at home, we might get an unwelcome visitor. We'll go to my bedroom in the rear. I followed to her bedroom. She flipped on a tiny blue light over a mirrored dressing table. The bedroom was done in pale blue and off-white. The queen-sized bed had a blue satin canopy over it. I sat down on the white silk chaise next to the dressing table. She switched on an ivory radio. Debussy's Clair de Lune sweet-noted gently through the room. She kicked off her tiny black calfskin shoes. She was even more beautiful here than she had been in the street. She stroked my earlobes with fingertips. She said, Mommy's pretty black panther, don't run away now. I'm going downstairs and make coffee. She went down the stairs. I thought, I'm going to crack on her for scratch. She should be good for a C-note at least. A C-note ain't bad to break the ice with. If she springs for it, I'll tie her to that bed and put my pepper specialty on her. It's certain to flip a young broad like her who's lived in heaven all her life. Besides, I ain't never sloughed around in a bed with a canopy, especially one in heaven. I heard the faint bounce of her tiny feet on the stairway. She came into the bedroom with a silver service. We were going to have coffee in style. She set the gleaming tray on the dressing table top. She said, Blood, pour us a cup. I'm going to get out of these clothes. Then we can chat. I poured two and left them black. I sipped mine. She stepped into a walk-in closet. She stepped out a moment later. All she had on were black panties and the red top of a transparent shorty nightgown. Her small but sculptured bosom straight jutted against the red gauze. She sat on the floor of the bed facing me and crossed her legs. I handed her the cup of black. She said, So, you're going to stay in town for a while? I said, Baby, if I get strong enough encouragement, I'll stay all my life. Baby, it's a pity I had to meet you when I'm in bad shape. I want to be good company, but that car problem and mama won't let my mind stay on a pleasant track. Her ringer snapped, Eureka! She got off the bed and went to the dresser across the room. She opened the top drawer and took out a bank book. She came back and sat on the bed. She tapped the red nail on her left finger against her white teeth. She studied the book's figures. I saw a frown hedgerow her brow. She got up and went to the dresser and threw the book into the open drawer and banged it shut. 
I thought, this broad has overdrawn. She's gonna try the check con on me. She stooped and opened the bottom drawer. She brought out a foot-long, foot-tall metal pig. She walked to the dressing table and put the pork on the table beside me. She said, Blood, this is the best I can do to help you now. I don't get my allowance for a week. I have less than a hundred dollars in my account. Cheer up. There must be at least a hundred dollars in quarters and halves in this bank. Believe me, I can vividly imagine what it's like to be colored and faced with your problems. Let's say it's a loan. I check its gross weight. It was heavy, all right. It felt a C-note heavy. I reached out and took her hand. I guided her to my side of the chaise. I put my arms around her. I kissed her and sucked at that sugary tongue like a suicidal diabetic. I leaned back from her. I looked into the heart of the blue fire. I said, Baby, it's a wonderful secret that you've discovered. Not many people know it's better to give than to receive. Maybe it sounds crazy, but I wish you weren't so beautiful and generous, so perfect. I don't see how you can miss capturing my foolish heart. You're a cinch to make me yours forever. Baby, I'm just a poor black country boy. Please don't hurt my heart. She sure had an appetite for the Jeff Con. The blue fire softened. Her eyes were misty and serious. She held my head between her dove soft palms. She said, Blood baby, I'm white, but I have been more unhappy than any black person all my life. My parents have never understood me. When my whole being cried out for love and understanding, they gave me shiny things to stop my tears. Non-whites are like dirt to them. They are narrow and cold. If they found out you have been here, they would disown me before they drop dead. There's a sweet warmth that you have. I know that you can make me happy. I am so desperate for love and understanding. Please give it to me. I said, baby, you can dump all your money on the black horse to win. I'm gonna win them all for you, beautiful. She said, Blood, you're a black panther. I'm a white lamb. I know nothing can stop that panther from taking the lamb, soul, and body. The lamb will bide her time to take the panther. The lamb needs and wants it that way. Now listen carefully and please catch the clue of my tragedy so nothing will shock you in my bed. Blood, perhaps you are aware of the structural flaws built into the columns of the world's most famous building. It's the Parthenon. The flaw is called entesis. The contrived flaw is necessary so that the fickle human eye sees only perfection. I am a lot like those columns. I am not old, but I am beautiful. My tragedy is that unlike the entesis that gives perfection to the columns, my entesis must be concealed to protect my perfection. Can you understand? I thought, what the hell? So this broad's got a prematurely gray cat. Maybe it's a little off-center. If it's odd, it will be a novelty kick for me. She's so beautiful, the tricks won't notice a tiny irregularity after I've turned her out. I said, Baby Melody, you haven't opened the door to a square. As fine as you are, I wish you had two heads. Now get on that bed on your back. I'm going to make love to you, Black Panther style. You got some long towels? She went to the hall linen closet. She gave me four long slender ones. She slipped off the red top and panties. She lay on her back in the bed. I saw her floor. Was this her entesis? I saw no crotch hair. She looked completely bald downstairs. I tied both her legs to the posts at the foot of the bed. I tied her left arm to a post at the head. The phone jangled on a nightstand at her side. She picked up the receiver with her free right hand. She said, Hi, Mother. I'm fine. Are you and Dad still having fun? Mother, I miss you both terribly. 
Are you coming home tomorrow as planned? Oh, good. I'll be at the airport on time. I've gone to bed. I've gotten out that anthology of Africa. I'm going to have a wild time researching the Watusi warrior. Good night, mother. Oh, tell dad to bring me some of the heavenly Miami beach wear. I'll be a sensation here on the beach this summer. I had taken my clothes off when she hung up. I lashed her free arm to the fourth bedpost. I looked down at her. Her eyes were pleading. She said, Remember, blood darling, you are not an unsophisticated bumpkin. You are not prone to shock states. I know you are going to find my entesis as sweet and desirable as the rest of me. I wonder why she still worried about her entesis. She knew I saw she was hairless downstairs. I put my knee on the bed. I stroked her belly. I felt cloth. I took a close look. A custom flesh-colored jock belt bandied her crotch. I ripped the elastic top down over her round hips. I jumped back. My rear end bounced off the floor. I struggled to my feet. I shouted, You stinky sissy son of a bitch! Her real emphasis had popped up pink and stiff. It was a foot long and as thick as the head of a cobra. He was crying like I had put a lighted match to his emphasis. He sobbed. You promise to understand. Please, blood, keep your promise. You don't know what you're missing. It's delicious, you fool. I said, look, man, I made my promises to a broad, not a stud. I'm a pimp, not a faggot. I'm getting the hell out of here. I'm charging you, the porker, for my time and your bullshit. He lay there blubbering. I speed dressed. I took the porker off the table and stuck it under my arm. I walked toward the stairway. I looked back. His beautiful face was ugly in anger and hate. He screamed, You dirty nigger liar thief! Untie me, you coon bastard! Oh, how I wish I had your black ass tied here on your belly! I said, Man, as slick as you are, you'll untie yourself before long. Yeah, that emphasis could murder me all right. I walked down the stairway. I went through the house to the back door. I walked down the driveway to the street. I walked for an hour before I got out of the residential sprawl. I was lucky to hail a yellow cab as soon as I got to a busy intersection. When it got me to the haven, the meter read 1430. I gave the cabbie a fin and a sawbuck. I looked up in my window. The runt was at it. It was 2 a.m. It had been like a nightmare Halloween all the way. All trick and no treat. I was icy sober. Then it struck me riding up on the elevator. That white faggot could cross me. What if he couldn't free himself by the time his folks got home? He was a cinch to cover himself. He'd say a nigger burglar or hold-up man had robbed him and trussed him up. I was a two-time loser. Five to ten would stick to me like flypaper. Even if he untied himself right away, he might be mad enough to frame me. I remember the Delansky pepper cross. I was sweating salt balls when I retrieved my stash in the broom closet. I went to my watch pocket with the cocaine. I knocked on 420. The runt opened the door. She was grinning. She said, Hello, Daddy Angel. Your dog bitch bumped her black ass off tonight. Got a piggy bank, huh? I said, So what you want, bitch? A medal for doing your whore duty? I didn't answer her question. I looked down to see if she'd sprouted an entesis. She was buck naked. I stepped inside and bolted the door. There were seventy slats on the dresser. I turned and lowered my face. She kissed me. I put the porker on the base of the kiss statue. 
I gave her the can of grass. She sat on the bed. She shook some grass out of the can onto a newspaper in her lap. She started rolling a joint. I took my clothes off. I went into the bathroom to shower and scrubbed the sissy taste out of my jib. The piercing, heavy odor of the gangster wafted to me. Over the roar of the shower, I shouted, Girl, there's a gap under that slammer. Chink it up with a rag or something. Torch a couple of sticks of incense. I came out of the bathroom and got into bed beside her. She handed me a joint. I lit it and sucked it into a roach. I squeezed tobacco from the tip of a cigarette. I stuck the butt of gangster into the empty tip. I twisted the end and lit it. It was a good reefer. I could feel my skull go into a dreamy float. I got one brilliant thought after another. The trouble was, each one I tried to hold long enough so I could put a saddle on it stampeded. It was maybe like the painful irritation a drunk wrangler suffers trying to corral a herd of greased mustangs. Gangster was sure a whore's high. That reefer confusion was no good for a pimp's skull. That beautiful sissy had buried a hot seed in my guts. The wildflower blossomed. I dreamily drifted into the runt. I rolled sleepily out of the warm churning tunnel. I wouldn't need a yellow tonight. Chapter 8 Grinning Slim I opened my eyes. I saw glinting stars of dust whirling like a golden hurricane through a bright shaft of noon sun. I looked through the open bedroom door. I saw the runt sitting at the living room window. She was doing her nails. She lifted her eyes from her nails. She looked into the bedroom. I said, Good morning, little freak puppy. I'm going to call Silas to run across the street for ham and eggs. Are you hungry? She said, Yeah, I'm hungry. But the way he moves around it would take him a week to cop. I'll slip on something and go myself. She went to the closet and slipped on her blue poplin rain or shine coat. She took a fin off the dresser and held it up for my consent. I nodded my head. I heard the door shut when she went out. I lit a cigarette. I thought, I wonder if Melody has the heat looking for me. I've only got a day or so left before Glass Top takes me to Sweet Jones. I'm gonna cool it. I won't go out at all. I'll stay right here in the hotel until Top calls me. The phone rang just as the runt came through the bedroom door. She put the plates wrapped in wax paper on the dresser. She picked up the receiver. I got up, took my plate, and started to eat with a plastic fork. She said, Hello? Oh, Chuck, how are you, sweetie? I was just thinking about you, lover. No, I can't. I, I wish I could come out for a few drinks, but my brother won't be home from work until six. Mama's not well at all. I have to stay here during the day to take care of her. I could slip out around seven. Yeah, I could do that until eight for twenty. Bye-bye, sugar blue eyes. She hung up the phone and her coat. She sat naked on the side of the bed eating. I said, bitch, I got an idea for that cat of yours. You gotta take a stiff brush and brush the hair straight down every time you think about it. Put some hair grower on it until you got maybe a four-inch cone. Your tricks will pant to bury their beaks in it. It will make your cat unique with that extra dimension. She mumbled. Where on earth did you get a jazzy idea like that? I said, bitch, ain't you hip yet? I'm a pimp with great imagination, that's all. She finished her flapjacks. She got up and gathered up an armful of our soiled clothing. She went into the bathroom. I heard the water sloshing in the bowl. She was doing our laundry. I turned my back to the sunlight. I felt old Morpheus slugging his velvet hammer against my eyelids. I woke up in darkness. I looked at the front room window. The street lights were on. I turned the nightstand lamp on. Mickey said 7-10. The runt was gone. She was breaking her luck 
with Chuck. I thought, Jesus, I sure needed rest, all right. That fast track I've been blundering on sure took the juice out of me. I got up and went into the bathroom to brush my teeth. I had made several brush strokes when the phone rang. I picked it up. He rapped before I could open my mouth. He said, Kit, this is Glass Top. The plans have changed. I'm in a hurry. Be outside your joint in 15 minutes. You got that? I said, yeah, but he had hung up. I dressed even faster than I had at the sissy's pad. I rushed down the hall. I stopped at the broom closet stash. I hurled the sizzle into the corner on the shelf. I took the stairs three at a time to the lobby. I sailed the key to the desktop. I bolted out the door. Top was parked in front of the joint in the red hog. He had his hand over the horn when he saw me. I got in. The hog squealed from the curb. Top was sure in a hurry. I could hear the harsh whisper of the hog's tires against the pavement. We passed that neon bouquet. I looked back and saw the funhouse sign flashing. I wondered if Melody was out here somewhere booby-trapping with his entesis. I said, Jack, I didn't expect your call for a couple of days. What happened? He said, There's a big boxing match tonight. All the biggest pimps and whores in the country are going to be at Sweets after the fight. Kind of like a party. All of them use stuff. Even with Sweet as the middleman, I should take off a couple of grand for my end. Sweet never goes to fights. He can't stand big crowds. And besides, they won't let Miss Peaches into fights. Sweet's gnawing his nails waiting for this stuff. He ain't got none for himself, and he's anxious to cop some stuff for those birds coming from the fight. I said, have you cracked anything about me to him? He said, kid, you ain't hip, I'm a genius. He called, and I rapped to him this morning. I played you off as my punk nephew from Kansas City. You got wild ideas, you wanna be a pimp. I've tried to chill you back to KC to maybe hustle pool or even be a broom mechanic. You're a stupid, stubborn punk. I've told you a thousand times, you ain't got it to pimp. You got a pimp. You would eat ten yards of sweets crap. You think he's God. You won't believe your uncle is tight with God. I'm glass top. I got to save face even for a snot-nosed punk. Maybe if you hang around the inside of the fast track for a hot minute, you'll get scared. You'll wise up, get out of my ass, and run your ass back to KC. Now, Kit, don't shoot your jib off at his pad. If he don't remember you from the roost, don't wake him up. I said, don't worry, Top. I won't rank us. I'll never forget you, pal, for the cut-in. That was sure some beautiful stuff you play for sweet. He caressed his patent leather hair. He erected his wide shoulders inside his blue mohair jacket. His pretty bitch face wore that terrible conceit and awful pride maybe of a cute mass murderer who never gets her victim's blood on her. The full moon through the windshield shone flush on his face. He said, Kid, you ain't heard nothing yet. Shit, I done drove three whores screaming crazy with this brain. They in the boob box upstate right now, babbling about pretty glass top. Even sweet ain't shit but two up there. He's been pimping almost twice as long as me. I said, Christ, Top, I don't get it. Why drive a whore nuts if she's still humping out the scratch? A stud would have to be slick as grease to plant bats in the skull of a bitch that was sane. I can't dig how a stud could do it. I ain't hip to it. He said, sucker, what you don't dig and ain't hip to would make a book bigger than this hog. Now you take sweet. The two he crossed were young white broads with small mileage. He's sick in the head. He's got an insane hate for the whole white race. He was a crumb crusher of seven down in Georgia when the white folks first poisoned his skull. His mammy was jet black and beautiful. The pecker words for miles around were aching to lay her. The son of the wealthy plantation owner that Sweet's old man sharecropped for waylaid her on the way to a spring. He punched her out, tore her clothes off, and socked it into her. She was naked and crying when she got back to her shack. The Peckerwood pig hid out in the woods. 
Sweet's old man came in from the fields and found his wife clawed and bawling. He was close to seven feet and weighed three hundred. Sweet still remembers how his old man hollered and butted his head against the door of the shack. The hinges ripped loose. He knew the woods like a fox. He found that white boy. He left him for dead. He covered him with brush. He slipped back to a shack. Sweet remembers the white boy's blood on his old man, even on his old man's bare feet. He has stomped the white boy to a red pulp out there in the lonely woods. The old man figured he was safe. The white folks would never find the corpse in those thick woods. He cleaned himself, repaired the shack door, and waited. He hadn't croaked the white boy. He had only maimed and paralyzed him. That night, a white man out possum hunting with his dogs heard the kid bleating under the brush. He was out of his skull. It was midnight before the kid's raving made sense to the white folks. Sweet heard the mob's horses galloping toward the shack. He hid in the loft just as the crazy gang came through the shack slammer. Sweet peeked through a crack and watched them beat his old man's head bloody. They dragged him outside. Sweet saw the whole mob rape his mother. Finally, all was quiet except for his mother whimpering on the bed. He sneaked out of the loft. Through the open door, he saw his old man swinging in the moonlight from a peach tree in front of the shack. His mammy went to the funny farm. Sweet was taken in by a sharecropper on the same plantation. He worked the fields until he got seventeen. He ran away and caught a freight train north. He was eighteen when he got his first whore. She was a white girl. He drove her to suicide before he got nineteen. Sweet's gotta be sixty now. He paused. He steered the hog with one hand. He took a cigarette from his jacket pocket. He punched in the dashboard lighter. I thought, no wonder Sweet's off his rocker. I wonder why Top really gave me that tight rundown on Sweet. The lighter popped. Top lit a cigarette. He sucked hard. He blew out a white cloud against the windshield that for an instant blotted out the moon. He said, I ain't insane like Sweet. My skull is clear and cool. I ain't no mixed up southern nigger. I was born in the north. I grew up with white kids. I don't hate white people or any other people. I ain't no black brute. I'm a pretty brown-skinned lover. I love people. When I was a square, I was even engaged to marry a white girl. Her parents and friends put pressure on her, and she chickened out. I guess I loved her. Right after we quit, I went to a hospital for my nerves. I ain't had nothing but whores since. It's like I told you when I met you. Sweet's a Ford, and I'm a Duesenberg. He's just an ugly, lucky nut. I said... But Top, you cracked. Your booby box score was higher than Sweet's. Those three gibbering bitches upstate sure don't show no love for whore people. He said, There you go, fool. A young chump is just like a dumb bitch. He can't figure nothing out himself. He's gotta have a rundown on everything. Of course I drove those whores crazy, but for a sane reason, sucker. A pimp cops a whore. He cons her, maybe if she stays in his corner, humping his pockets fat. At the end of the rainbow, she's got a husband and a soft easy chair. To hold her beak to the grindstone, he pumps air castles into her skull. She takes all the stable grief. She humps her ass into a cramp to outshine the other whores in the family. At first, it's easy for the bitch to star. As she gets older and uglier, her competition gets younger and prettier. She don't have to be no brain to wake up. There ain't no easy chair at the end. She gets hip. There ain't never even been a rainbow. She gets larceny in her heart. She bullshits herself that if she can drive all those young pretty whores away from the pimp, that rainbow might come true after all. If it don't, she'll get her revenge anyway. It's a violation of the pimp book to quit a whore. A bitch like that is a ticking bomb. Every day, her value to the pimp drops to the zero line. She's old, tired, and dangerous. She can rattle a pimp into goofing his whole game. 
If the pimp is a sucker, he'll try to drive her away with his foot in her ass. She's almost a cinch to croak him or cross him into the joint. I am a genius. I'm hip that after a bitch has had maybe 10,000 tricks drill her, she ain't too steady, skull-wise. I don't tip her I'm salty and disgusted. I talk like a sweet head shrinker to her. Instead of air castles, I pump her full of H. Her skull starts to jelly. I'll be worried as hell about her. I'll start sneaking slugs of morphine or chloral hydrate into her shots. While she's out, I'll maybe douse her with chicken blood. She comes to, I'll tell her I brought her in from the street. I tell her I hope you didn't croak anybody while you were sleepwalking. I got a thousand ways to drive him goofy. The last board I flipped, I hung her out a fifth floor window. I had given her a jolt of pure cocaine so she'd wake up outside that window. I was holding her by both wrists. Her feet were dangling in the air. She opened her eyes. When she looked down, she screamed like a scared baby. She was screaming when they came to get her. You see, kid? I'm all business. I ain't got an ounce of hate in me. He had been driving for at least an hour. I had lost track of time and space. I saw no black faces in the streets around us. I saw tall, gleaming apartment houses. Some so tall, they seemed welded to the night sky. I said, yeah, Top, you're a cold, clever stud, all right. I'm sure glad you're yanking my coat. Jesus, sweet must live in a white neighborhood. He said, yeah, kid, he lives just around the next corner in a penthouse. Like I told you, he's lucky as a shithouse rat. It's a million dollar building. The old white broad that owns it is Sweet's freak white dog. I said, but don't the white tenants blow the roof because Sweet lives there? He said, Sweet's old white broad owns the building, but Sweet runs it. At least he runs it through an old ex-pimp pal. Sweet stuck him into a pad on the ground floor. Patch Eye, the old stud, collects the rents and keeps the porters and other flunkies on their toes. All the tenants are white gamblers and hustlers. Sweet has got the old ex-pimp running book wide open. The action a day just from the tenants run two or three grand. I'll say it a thousand times. Sweet is a lucky old stud. He turned the corner. He eased the hog into the curb in front of a snow-white apartment building. A moss-green canvas canopy ran from the edge of the curb 25 yards to the Klieg-lighted fancy front of the building. A gaunt white stud in a green monkey suit was standing in stooped attention at the curb. We got out. Top walked around the hog to the doorman. The doorman said, Good evening, gentlemen. Top said, Hello, Jack. Do me a favor. When you take my wheels to the back, see that it's parked close to an exit. When I come out, I don't want a hassle out of there. Here's a fin buster. The doorman said, Thank you, sir. I'll relay your wish to Smitty. We walked into the green-painted, black-marbled foyer. I was trembling like maybe a hick virgin on a casting couch. We walked up the half-dozen marble steps to an almost invisible glass door. A Boston coffee-colored broad slid it open. We stepped into the green and pearl lobby. A tan broad as flashy as a cotton club pony sat behind a blonde desk. We walked across the quicksand pearl carpet to the front of it. She flashed two perfect dozen of the thirty-two. Her voice was contralto silk. She said, Good evening. May I help you? Top said, Steward and Lancaster to see Mr. Jones. She turned to an elderly black broad sitting before a switchboard beside her. She told her, Penthouse, Mr. Stewart and Lancaster. The old broad shifted her earphones from round her wrinkled neck to her horns. She plugged in and started batting her chops together. After a moment, she nodded to the pony. We got the ivory flash again. The pony said, Thank you so much for waiting. Mr. Jones is at home and will see you. I followed Top to the elevators. A pretty brown-skinned broad in a tight green uniform zipped us to the 15th floor. 
The brass door opened. We stepped out onto a gold-carpeted entrance hall. It was larger than Top's living room. A skinny Filipino in a gold lame outfit came toward us. He was grinning and bowing his head. His lank hair flopped across his skull like the wings of a wounded raven. The crystal chandelier overhead glittered his gold suit. He took my lid. He put it on the limb of a mock mother of pearl tree. He said, Good evening. Follow, please. We followed him to the brink of a sunken living room. It was like a pasha's passion pit. A green light inside the gurgling bowl of a huge fountain beamed on the vulgar face of a stone woman squatting over it. She was nude and big as a baby elephant. The red light inside her skull blazed, her eyes staring straight ahead. Her giant hands pressed the tips of her long breasts into each corner of her wide open mouth. She was peeing serenely and endlessly into the fountain bowl. We stepped down to the champagne oriental carpet. Sweet was sitting across the dim room on a white velour couch. He was wearing a white satin smoking jacket. He looked like a huge black fly in a bucket of milk. Miss Peaches was curled at his side. She was resting her black spotted head on a silk turquoise pillow. Sweet was stroking her back. She purred and locked her yellow eyes on us. I got a whiff of her raw animal odor. Sweet said, Sit your black asses down. Sweetheart, you've been dangling me. What happened? Did that raggedy nickel hog break down? So this is your square country nephew, huh? Top sat on the couch beside Miss Peaches. I sat in the blue velour chair several yards to the side of Top. Sweet's gray eyes were flicking up and down me. I was nervous. I grinned at him. I jerked my eyes away to a large picture on the wall over the couch. A naked white broad was on her hands and knees. A Great Dane, with his red tongue lolling out, was astraddle her back. He had his paws hooked under her breasts. Her blonde head was turned looking back at him. Her blue eyes were popped wide open. Top said, Man, that hog ain't no plane. I got here quick as I could. You know I don't play no games on you, honey. I said, Thank you, Mr. Jones, for letting me come up with Unc. My voice triggered the roost memory. He stiffened and glared at me. He smashed his hooks together. It sounded like pistol shots. Peaches growled and sneered. He said, Ain't you the little shitball I chased out of the roost? I said, yeah, I'm one and the same. I want to beg your pardon for making you salty that night. Maybe I could have gotten a pass if I had told you I'm your pal's nephew. I ain't got no sense, Mr. Jones. I took after my idiot father. Sweet said, Top, this punk ain't hopeless. He's silly as a bitch grinning all the time, but dig how he butters out of the con to keep his balls out of the fire. He sure ain't got no tender dick to turn down my pretty big ass Mimi. Kid, I love black boys with the urge to pimp. Ain't no sure way to amount to something. Your uncle ain't but a good pimp. I'm the greatest in the world. He wired me he's hoping you'll fold on his track and split back to the sticks. You got one whore, he tells me. You could have the makings. This joint is going to be crawling with fast whores in a couple of hours. I'm gonna be pinning you. I'm gonna watch how you handle yourself. Maybe I'm gonna make you my protege. You gotta be icy, understand, kid? Icy, icy. You gotta stop that grinning. Freeze your map. And keep it that way. Maybe I'm gonna prove to your half-assed pimp uncle that I can train even a mule to win the Kentucky Derby. Top said, Shit, honey. You don't have to tip him. I'm pulling for his split. I love the kid. I just don't think he can cut the pimp game. The kid raps good. I ain't denying it. He should be maybe a Murphy player. 
or even a mitt man. His ticker ain't icy enough to pimp on this track. I thought Top's pad is a pigsty compared to this layout. It looks like I'm in. Sweet said, Sweetheart, let's go in the bedroom and cap up and bag that stuff for those jokers. I'm gonna have old Patch Eye come up here and deal it off. I ain't no dope peddler. I'm a pimp. Kid, you can cool it. Have the Filipino bring you a taste. If you want, get it yourself from the ball over there. They went around a hand-painted gold silk screen through a doorway. Peaches padded behind them. I saw a bronze bell on a table beside the couch. I decided to get my own taste. I walked across the room to a turquoise bar. I went behind it. I took a tall crystal glass off the mirrored shelf on the wall. I mixed creme de menthe and bubbly water. I took my green cool drink and walked toward the floor to ceiling glass door. I slid it open and stepped up into the patio. I looked up. The April Zephyrs were balleting the burnt orange and pale green Japanese lanterns. They danced on glowing jade cords strung high above the lime floor. The ice cream yellow moon seemed close enough to lick. I walked to the pearl parapet. I looked out at a brilliant sea of emerald and ruby neon bursting pastel sky rockets toward a cobalt blue sky bejeweled with sapphire stars. I thought, Sweet Shore has caught lightning in a thimble. He came out of the white man's cotton fields. He's pimped himself up to this. He's living high in the sky like a black god in heaven with the white people. He ain't no nigger, doctor. He ain't no hot-shot nigger preacher, but he's here. He pimped up his scratch passport. That barbed wire stockade is a million miles away. I got more education. I'm better looking and younger than he is. I know I can do it too. I remembered Henry and how religious he was. Look what happened to him. I remember how I used to kneel every night by the side of the bed to pray. I really believed in God then. I knew he existed. Now, I wasn't so sure. I guess the first prison rap started to hack away at my belief in him. I often wondered in the cell how, if he existed, he could let the dummy destroy Oscar who loved him. I told myself at the time, maybe he's got complicated long-range plans. Maybe he's even got divine reason for letting the white folks butcher black people down south. Maybe some morning about dawn, all the black folks will sing hallelujah. God's white board of directors will untie the red tape. God will roll up his sleeves. He'll smash down the invisible stockades. He'll kill all the rats in the black ghettos. Fill all the black bellies and con all the white folks that niggers are his children too. Now I couldn't wait. If he were up there or not, I had to go with the odds. I stared into the sky. It was the first time I'd prayed since Steve, the tramp. I know now it was more a fearful alibi than anything else. I said... Lord, if you're up there, you know I'm black and you know my thoughts. Lord, if the Bible is really your divine book, then I know it's a sin to pimp. If you're up there and listening, you know I'm not trying to con you. Lord, I'm not asking you to bless my pimping. I ain't that stupid. Lord, I know you ain't black. Surely you know if you're up there what it's like to be black down here. These white folks are doing all the fine living and sucking up all the gravy. I gotta have some of that living and some of that gravy. I don't want to be a stick-up man or a dope peddler. I'm sure as hell won't be a porter or a dishwasher. I just want to pimp, that's all. It's not too bad because whores are rotten. Besides, I ain't going to croak them or drive them crazy. I'm just going to pimp some real white type living out of them. So Lord, if you're up there listening, do one for me. 
Please don't let me croak before I live some and get to be somebody down here in the white man's world. I don't care what happens after that. I looked down over the parapet. I wondered if the Undertaker had been born yet who was slick enough to paste a sucker's ass together after a Brody 15 stories down. I heard Tuxedo Junction pulsing behind me. I had pitched my pipes dry. I upended my drink. I turned and walked toward the glass door. I saw the Japanese lanterns splashing color on the polished alabaster top tables. The Filipino had sure been busy flopping his mop. I slid the door open to a chorus of profanity. The whore scent flared my nostrils. There must have been thirty yapping pimps and whores lounging around the spacious pit. I stepped down and slid the door shut. An ebony satin skin pimp was sprawled into the blue velour chair. A tawny tan tigress was kneeling before him between his legs. She had her chin rammed into his crotch. She clutched him around the waist like a humping two-dollar trick in an alley. Her dreamy maroon eyes rolled toward the top of her long skull. She was staring at his fat blue lips. It was maybe she expected him to whistle the lost chord. The rock on his finger exploded blue-white frozen fireworks. He raised his glass to curse all square bitches. He was contoasting all whores. The room got silent. Somebody had strangled the gold phonograph in the corner. He toasted, Before I'd touch a square bitch's slit, I'd suck a thousand clappy pricks and swim through liquid shit. They got green puke between their rotten toes and snot runs from their funky noses. I hope all square bitches become syphilitic wrecks. I hope they fall through their own assholes and break their motherfucking necks. It was the first time I heard it. It was the first time for the crowd, too. They roared and begged him to do it again. He looked toward the hand-painted Chinese screen. All eyes turned the top and sweet coming into the room. An old black stud wearing a white silk patch over his right eye trailed behind them. Peaches followed him. He looked like a vulture decked out in a gray mohair vine. Peaches stood before the white velour couch and bared her fangs. The three pimps sitting on it scattered off like quail under a double-barreled shotgun. They thumped their rear ends to the carpet. Sweet, Top, and Peaches sat on the couch. I sat on a satin pillow in the corner near the glass door. I watched the show. I saw Patch Eye go and sit behind the bar. Everybody was in a big half circle around the couch. It was like the couch was a stage, and Sweet was the star. Sweet said, Well, how did you silly bastards like the fight? Did the nigger murder that Pecklewood, or did his black ass turn shit yellow? A southern white whore with a wide face and a sultry voice like Bankhead's drawled, Mr. Jones, I'm happy to report that the nigger ran the white stud back into his mammy's ass in the first round. Everybody laughed except Sweet. He was crashing together his mitts. I wondered what madness bubbled in his skull as he stared at her. A high-ass yellow broad flicked life back into the phonograph. Gloomy Sunday, the suicide's favorite, dirged through the room. She stared at me as she came away. Sweet said, All right, you freakish pigs. Patch Eyes got outfits and bags of poison. You got the go sign to croak yourselves. They started rising from the satin pillows and velour ottomans. They clustered around Patch Eye at the bar. The high-ass yellow broad came to me. She stooped in front of me. I saw black tracks on her inner thighs. The inside of her gaping cat was beefsteak red. She had a shiv slash on the right side of her face. It was a livid gully from her cheekbone to the corner of her twisted mouth. Smallpox craters covered her face.
I caught the glint of a pearl-handled switchblade in her bosom. Her gray eyes were whirling in her skull. She was high. I was careful. I grinned. Sweet was digging us. He was shaking his head in disgust. I wondered if he thought I ought to slug her in the jib and maybe take that shiv in the gut. She said, Let me see that pretty dick, handsome. I said, I don't show my swipe to strange bitches. I got a whore to pamper my swipe. She said, Nigga, you ain't hear me. I'm Red Cora from Detroit. That red is for blood. You ain't hit my thieving bitch that croaked two studs? Now I said, show that dick. Call me Cora, little bullshit nigga. Ain't you a bitch with one whore? You're gonna starve to death, nigga, if she's a chump flatbacker. Nigga, you better get hip and cop a thief. A big husky broad with a spike in one hand and pack of stuff in the other took me off the hook. She need Cora's spine. She said, Bitch, I'm gonna shoot this dope. You want some? You can Georgia this skinny nigga later. I watched Cora's rear end twist away from me. She and the husky broad went to the bar and got a spoon and a glass of water. I looked at Sweet. He was giving me a cold stare. I thought, this track is too fast, I can't protect myself. With young soft bitches like the runt, I'm a champ. These old hard bitches I gotta solve. I gotta be careful and not blow Sweet. If I suck her out any more tonight, he'll freeze and boot me. I sat in the corner bug-eyed for two hours. My ears flapped to the super slick dialogue. I was excited by the fast-paced, smooth byplay between these wizards of pimpdom. Red Cora kept me edgy. She went to the patio several times. She was head out of her skull. Each time she passed, she cracked on me. She was sure panting to view my swipe. Several of Sweet's whores came in. None of them had been at the roost with him that first time I saw him. All of them were fine with low mileage. One of them was yellow and beautiful. She couldn't have been more than 17. There was a giant black pimp from the Apple. He had three of his whores with him. He had been boasting about how he had his swipe trained. He was one of the three at the party that didn't bang stuff. I had watched him snort girl and down a few mixed drinks. He had a glass in his hand standing over Sweet and top on the couch. He said, Sweet, ain't a bitch living can pop me off unless I want her to. I don't care if she's got velvet suction cups in her cat. Her jib can have a college degree. She ain't gonna make me pop against my will. I got the toughest swipe in the world. I got a C note to back my crack. Sweet said, Sucker, I got a young bitch I turned out six months ago that could blow that tender suck swipe of yours in five minutes. I ain't gonna teach you no lesson for a measly C note. If that C note ain't all you got, Put five bills in Top's mitt and you got a bet. The big joker snatched a roll from his side pocket. He plunked five C-notes into Top's palm. Sweet eased a bale of C-notes from the pocket of his smoking jacket. He covered the bet in Top's hand. Sweet snapped his fingers. The beautiful yellow broad kneeled before the standing giant. She started to perform before the cheering audience. Within less than three minutes, she had won the bet for Sweet. The big joker stood there for a long moment with his eyes closed. He had a goofy grin on his face. One of his whores snickered. He slapped her hard against the jaw. He went to the bar. I thought, she sure has a head for business. Pepper was great but she couldn't hold this broad's douchebag. I got up and went behind the Chinese screen through the door. I went down a long hall. I passed three way out bedrooms. I went into a mirrored john. It was as big as a bedroom. 
I pushed the door shut. I should have locked it. I walked to the stool. I raised the lid. That tough bitch, Red Cora, darted in. She was licking now her red tongue. Her gray eyes were voodooing in her skull. She was hot as hell for my relative innocence and youth. She was a double murderess with a skull load of H and a hot jib. I stood there before the deadly bitch. I searched the thin catalog in my skull. I didn't know the right crack for a situation like this. I mumbled a plaintive pitch. I said, Now listen, girl. You haven't given me a nickel. I'm not your man. It was like trying to stand off a starving leopard with a broom straw. She snaked that shiv out of her bosom and popped the gleaming blade open. She clawed my fly open with the other hand. I heard buttons bounce on the towel floor. My ticker was doing a foxtrot. She said, You jivin' pretty son of a bitch. You ain't no pimp. I'm gonna eat your sweet ass up or chop off your dick. I backed up to the wall beside the stool. I could feel the wet, throbbing tips of my fingers against the cool tile. She was grabbing inside when Sweet bowled in. He seized a fistful of her long hair. She squealed in pain. He jerked her away from me toward the door. He cussed her as he drove his needle-toed shoe into her wide caboose several times. He said, Bullshit, bitch. This chump is in my school. I ain't gonna let you Georgia him. Now nix, bitch. Nix. I heard her high heel staccato against the tile as she fled. He turned toward me. His black face was gray with fury. Maybe Sweet would forget I wasn't yellow. I remembered what Top had told me about those four murders. He thrust his flat black nose against mine. I could feel a spray of spit strike my lips as he cursed me. He twisted the collar of my vine like a garrote around my throat. He had snatched me six feet from the wall. He shouted, Listen, you stupid little motherfucker. You know why that bitch screwed you around? You're always grinning like a Cheshire cat. What's so funny? Can't I get the sucker out of you? I can't make a pimp out of a pussy like you. I told you once. Do I have to tell you a thousand times, green ass nigga? To be a good pimp, you gotta be icy. Cold. Like the inside of a dead horse pussy. Now, if you a bitch, a sissy, or something, let me know. I'll put you in drag, and you can whore for me. Stay out of my face, nigga, until you freeze up and stop that sucker-ass grinning. I heard his ground grippers skid against the floor as he hurled me against the wall. The back of my skull torpedoed into it. Through a drowsy fog of pain, I saw him float away. My back snailed down the wall. I laughed at the funny way the shoe tips turned in as the long legs glided across the tile. I sat there on the cool floor, gazing at the weird comical legs stretched out before me. I saw a pair of blue mohair legs right angle the flat ones. I looked up. It was Top. He bent over to help me up. He said, Kid, now you believe the ugly bastard is insane? Take this key to my hog. Get it out of the lot and back. Park in the block and cool it. I'm getting out of here myself as soon as I cop my end of the smack scratch. I riveted my eyes to the champagne carpet. I zigzagged through the snickering whores and pimps. I made it across the pit to the elevator. The Filipino was standing beside it. He was pressing the down button. He looked like a friendly brown snake sausaged in gold foil. He reached up and stroked my jacket collar down flat from around my ears. He took my lid off the pearl tree. He stuck it on my skull and snapped the brim. I felt the sweat man needle the aching boil. I adjusted my lid. He said, Good night, sir. Sammy hopes you had fine time. I said, 
Sammy, pal, it's been a wild night. I'll never forget it. I got a whiff of crotch as the elevator plunged to the lobby. I wondered if the pretty brown-skinned jockey hoard a little bit as a sideline. I stepped out of the gilded cage into the lobby. I saw a winking red-arrowed sign in the rear. I walked to the glass door below it. I went down the white stone steps to the parking lot. I stopped Top's red hog in the ocean of cars. I went to it, unlocked it, and got in. A big white Buick was parked in front of it. A grinning brown-skinned joker in white overalls came toward the Buick. I saw Smitty blue-stitched across his breast pocket. He pulled the Buick out. I keyed the hog and scooted it out of the lot. I whipped around the corner and coasted to the curb 50 feet from the entrance of Sweet's apartment building. I shut the motor off. I lowered the driver's side window. I put my lid on the seat. I threw my head back on the top of the seat. I closed my eyes. I dozed. Something was crushing my jaw. A blind spotlight burned into my eyeballs. I heard a foghorn voice. It blasted. Police officers! Nigger! What the hell you doing? What's your name? Show us your identification! I couldn't answer with my jaw crushed in the vice. I was dazed. I lowered my eyes below the inferno of light. I saw a white, brutish wrist. Thick black hair bristled on it. I saw muscles cord and ripple across it as the vice tightened around my jawbone. I wondered if the copper was Satan and I had croaked in the hog and was being checked into hell. Hell or not, Satan wanted identification. I remembered the fox and the horse. I didn't even have a hide. Satan swung the hog door open. The door frame blackjacked the top of my skull as Satan yanked me from the hog. He released my jaw and slammed me across the hood of the hog. My wet palms skidded on the top of it. Satan's fellow demon was punch frisking me from breast to shoe soles. He poked an index finger inside my shoe. I felt a tickle in the arch of my instep. I said, my name is Albert Thomas. Hell, I wasn't doing anything, officers. I was just waiting for my uncle. I lost my wa- I didn't finish. A galaxy of shooting stars orbited my skull. It was like a flame-hot poker was embedded in that sore bump in the back of my skull. I heard a tinkle of glass against the hood. I puked and nosedived to the hood. I felt the warm, stinking mess against my cheek as I lay across the hood gasping. Glass splinters sparkled on the hood. Satan has slugged his flashlight against my skull. I saw the fellow demon's shadow bobbing inside the hog. He was frisking it, too. Satan said, Nigga, you got a sheet downtown? What you do for a living? I whispered, I've never been in trouble. I'm an entertainer. I'm a dancer. He said, You black conning bastard. How in the fuck do you know what a sheet is? You been mugged, nigger. Stand up straight. I'm gonna take you downtown. You can jig a few steps on the show-up stage. I struggled off the hood. I turned and faced him. I looked up into the red, puffy face. Top came around the back of the hog and stood between us. He said, What's the beef, officer? This is my nephew and my Cadillac. The kid was waiting for me. He's clean. We've been to a party at Sweets. You know who he is. We're personal friends of his, you dig? Satan's puffy face creased into a hyena grin. He rapped on the windshield. I saw the demon's starch white face peer over the rear seat. Satan waved him from the hog. He clambered out and stood beside Satan. Satan said, Looks like we made a slight mistake, Johnny. These gentlemen are pals of Mr. Jones. Mister, all your nephew had to do to beat the rouse was mention a name. Christ, we have to do our job. There's a cat burglar operating in this district. The lieutenant is riding our asses to nab him. 
Sorry about the whole thing, gentlemen. The rollers walked across the street. They got into a black Chevrolet and gunned it away. I took a handkerchief from my back pocket and wiped my face. I wiped the bits of loose glass and most of the puke off the hood. I threw the rag in the gutter. I got in the hog. Top U-turned and headed back to Blacktown. I touched the bump on my skull. I felt a spot of sticky ooze. My skull had only a tiny split. I wiped my fingers on the end of my lapel pocket handkerchief. I thought, if it gets any rougher on this track, I'll be punchy before long. Maybe I better take Preston's advice and go back to the sticks. I said, geez, Sweet Jones sure has got pull. It was like magic when you cracked his name. Top said, magic your black ass. The only magic is in that C-note a week sweet lays on him. Every copper in the district from Captain down greases his mitts in that lard bucket in Sweet's pocket. Mary Mammy of Jesus, you stink. You must have shit your pants. You sure getting funky breaks, kid. Too bad you couldn't handle Red Cora. She's one of the fastest thieves in the country. I said, look, Top, if that crazy pocked faced bitch had a tunnel straight into Fort Knox, I wouldn't fart in her jib. I hate old hard leg whores. He said, that's a chump crack. After you get hit to the pimp game, you'll take scratch from a gold tooth three-legged bulldog with two heads. Say, listen, Kit, don't ever forget to keep that rundown on sweet under your lid. I'm the only stud he told. He'd twist my skull off and play soccer with it. I said, now, Top, that's a hell of a crack to make. Do I look like the kind of rat square that would cross a pal? I was glad when I saw the Haven's blue sign. Top parked across the street from it. I got out. I had crossed to the middle of the street. Top blew the horn. I turned back to the side of the hog. Top had my lid and a small square of paper in his hand. I took them. He said, Kit, here's my phone number in case you want to ring me for something. Take it easy now. I passed through the lobby. The indicator pointed out the elevator was at the fourth floor. I took the stairs and picked up the sizzle from the broom closet. The runt let me in after the first knock. I walked by her to the bedroom and stuck the sizzle in the coat pocket in the doorway. I tossed them in the pile in the corner. She said, Daddy, when you passed me, you smelled like you'd been dunked in a garbage truck. What happened? I headed for the bathroom. I was standing over the stool. She followed me. She stood in the bathroom doorway. I looked over my shoulder at her. I said, bitch, some white rollers busted me tonight. They got the wire I'm in town to pimp. They took me down and beat the puke out of me. Baby, they wanted me to finger you. They wanted to know where you worked. Shit, I was too pure in heart to put a finger on you, baby. I'm not feeling worth a damn. So go on a dummy, okay? I flushed the toilet. I turned the shower on. I gave her a hard look and frowned. She turned and got into bed. I took Mickey off. It was 4 a.m. I showered and toweled off. I fell into bed without checking the scratch on the dresser. I went to sleep wondering what to do to solve the fast track. We have reached the end of this portion of the miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. Send a friend request to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where if you'd like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407.
or Cash App. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me on my other channel, RGMC Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and right here on TURN, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks for the continuation of this Iceberg Slim mini-series on Ralph Reed's Don't Do Anything I Wouldn't Do.